Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd just like to talk to you today about how uh, we can use the outputs of the cumulative impact analysis that we did after the Aurora workshop to start to prioritize future monitoring uh, and research activities and think about how we can build collaborations among stakeholders. As we've talked about before, this is really forming the basis for adaptive management. Those three clear key roles, first one around identifying objectives and desired outcomes. The second, building a, a assessment process that includes all the positive and negative effects. And that was what was done in the cumulative impacts assessment workshops that will run after Avora uh, and the draft report that you have. Um, and now to design a monitoring program to test the assessment and to ensure that the desired outcomes are actually being achieved. This is part of a much bigger process that looks at not only identifying what all of the uh, objectives are and the outcomes that are desired, but building in that assessment and evaluation process so you understand where the, the, the key risks are and what uh, what's causing those key risks and also building in that monitoring and evaluation process so that you can test those assumptions and really make sure that the things that you want to achieve are actually being achieved for the system. To give an example of how this has been applied, I'm going to talk briefly about um, a series of assessments that were done around Australia on high productivity areas um, uh, all the way around Australia. And for all of those different high productivity features, we built the similar sort of qualitative models to the ones that you've seen uh, from the post Avora workshops, the cumulative impact workshops. And we looked at all of the high productivity areas around Australia. We looked in it for, in a particular case, in a place called Bonny Upwilling off Southern Australia, where there's a really high area of productivity um, associated with a um, intermittent upwelling that occurs in that particular location. And what we wanted to do was look to see which of the different pressure scenarios were actually causing an impact and whether we could identify the correct model uh, as part of that. So obviously there was a proper uh, qualitative model, very similar to the ones that you've seen presented uh, as part of the post Avora workshop. And this is obviously a model for a pelagic ecosystem. Um, and we built into that all of the pressures that were actually occurring on the system. And what we wanted to see was, are the patterns of um, these, some of the, the ecosystem components here changing in the way that we expect them to change under different scenarios. In this case, what we we're looking at to see, what, what we we're looking to see was, is there a decrease in the total chlorophyll A on the surface um, over the long term? And we can see here, from this figure that there is a long-term decrease in that central portion um, where we're expecting to see a much stronger upwelling. So we're actually seeing that the total chlorophyll starting to decrease in those particular locations. We can then ask the question, well, which of the different models would we be expecting to see exactly those? A variety of climate change pressure scenarios, more fur seals and, uh, and less upwelling and more fur seals and more upwelling. And we were trying to disentangle these particular different uh, pressure scenarios that were actually occurring. What we found was the, the patterns that we we're expecting to see were most consistent with the scenario of climate change occurring um, along with less unwilling and not a significant impact from fur seals. So that's one of the things, one of the key things here is we were able to identify which specific pressure scenario we we're actually using and using the observations, the monitoring observations that we, would, that we had to actually select and identify exactly which scenario we were in. So how might we assess and apply this to uh, deep sea vent communities? Well, obviously we have a qualitative model for both hydrothermally vent active uh, habitats and also for the pelagic and, and sediment habitats. But what I'm going to talk mostly about here is the, the hydrothermally, hydrothermally active habitat ecosystem. So this is the qualitative model here. It's, it's, it's a reasonably complicated 
uh, model, but it picks up all, it was developed as part of an expert process and picks up all of the important parts of the system. What can we use this for? Well, in a, in a really complex system like that one, we, it can actually be very difficult to identify what is causing the impacts. So you may actually be unsure about exactly which part of the, which, which one of the pressures is actually causing an impact on the system. The, qual the qualitative models can do is identify the indicators that will identify which of the impact scenarios is occurring, identify uh, the indicators that will always show if an impact is occurring, and also identify potentially what the correct ecosystem model is if you've got multiple different models that might be telling you slightly different things. So is a, in, in the hydrothermal events, hydrothermally active events, when we look at those complex pressure scenarios, and I'm going to concentrate here primarily on the scenario where we've got a hydrothermally inactive uh, sulfide deposit uh, exploited in the same vent field as an active um, hydrothermal vent. And the question is, well, which, which of the pressure scenarios are we actually in? Well, from, if we were monitoring the physical side of things, we could tell that we were in scenario 3D because that's the only time where we see warm diffuse flow decreasing. We could see if we were in scenario 3C because that's the only time when we see uh, cool diffuse flow increasing. We could tell if we were in scenario 3B because that's the only time when uh, focus flow decreases and there's no cho change in any of the, the other flows. But it may not always be possible to monitor the physical in those particular ways. So we might want to see um, uh, how we can monitor the biological components of the system. So again, the question is, which of those in scenario three, which of the different scenarios are we actually part of? Well, we can tell straight away that we're in scenario 3B if we see that suspended uh, microorganisms decreasing and grazes increasing. And that tells us quite clearly that's the particular pressure scenario that we're seeing here. Um, if we want to identify um, uh, scenario 3D, we can see that the only time that warm diffuse flow attached microorganisms are not really changing or changing weekly uh, is in scenario 3D. And so if we wanted to identify that, we'd focus on those particular those particular species, those particular species and phyla. If we wanted to identify uh, scenario 3A, then in that case, we would find that if particulate organic matter produced chemosynthetically was strongly decreasing, but there was no change in suspended microorganisms, we'd expect to be in that scenario there. So by teasing, looking at the outputs and the, the changes, the expected changes of, of increases and decreases, we can disentangle which of the scenarios we are actually in and which of the pressures are actually causing any one of those things. So it provides us with a lot of information about different parts of the system and which different parts we should monitor because some of the parts uh, will so change under every scenario. And so if we really wanted to detect that actually change was definitely happening, we could look at the, the uh, exogenous dispersal phages of vent species and also the non-vent biota, and they would show us unambiguously that if they were, they unambiguously decrease in every pressure scenario. So those are a species that would not be useful for actually disentangling which scenario, but would always tell us that we were having some sort of an impact. So again, the, the particular species that you are monitoring will be determined by what you're actually trying to achieve and the monitoring question that you're trying to actually answer. You may also be interested in knowing which of two different competing models you're actually in. And for the pelagic systems, we actually had to, uh, developed two slightly different models um, that give very slightly different outcomes. And so if we want to know which one of those is sort of correct, as far as we can tell, well, we'd expect to see in model one, we'd expect to see plankton increasing, and in model two, we'd expect to see no real change. The other thing that these models are able to actually do is start to identify the places where we're not really certain, where we need more research. And those light blue areas, light yellow areas rather, that you can see there 
which are the site called the sign indeterminate um, areas, identify which parts of the system we're not really sure about. Um, and we may want to do more research. So those are those sort of places where you're seeing uh, quite distinct um, patterns of, oh, not, not indistinct patterns of change where you're seeing those light, bl bl light yellow squares are places where you might want to focus additional research so you could resolve those particular questions and resolve the strength of the interactions between those, those particular species and the species that they're interacting with. So the key results out of the come out of here is, is that this starts to allow us to enable us to build monitoring questions for particular uh, for partic to answer particular things about the objectives we're setting. We can start to identify what will be impacted and by what pressures under different scenarios. We can start to identify unambiguous indicators of change, and we can start to identify a correct ecosystem model if that's actually one of the things we're testing. Thank you very much.